It's time to straighten up and fly right because Jim Sterling is back. Back without having missed a Jimquisition. That's how great I am. That's why I'm the greatest showman in games media. Because I can write, record, edit, produce, film, publish entire Jimquisition episodes while suffering through gallbladder pain, which some women say is equal to, if not worse than, the pain of childbirth. Now, I am not saying that I'm stronger than all mothers, okay? Mother strong, save our troops. What I am saying is that I think I'm better than I say I am, and I say I'm the fucking best. That's why I thank God for me, and that's why the surgery was a success. When your old pal Jim Sterling first started reporting on Steam's lack of quality control, first of all let me remind you I was in the minority at the time because Valve was still the golden boy and nobody agreed with me how quickly I'll change your fucking tune. But more importantly, I was focused purely on the games. The games to me, were the problem as far as Steam's abhorrent lack of quality control was concerned. From early access piss takes like Earth Year 2066 to multiple companies buying and reselling the same fucking software, I was focused predominantly on the games themselves and why saturating the Steam storefront and crowding out products with some effort put into them was a problem. However, over the course of the past year I've changed my opinion somewhat, or at least realigned it. I've hinted at this in prior episodes, but today we're going into detail regarding the sentiment that lazy hack job asset flips are the symptom while the deluded unhinged hacks making them are the real symptom source of the issue. A source that Valve itself has full power to eradicate almost overnight if it could just get over its aversion to enforcing any sort of fucking rule. Let me take you back to August 28, 2013. This is the day Steam greenlit 100 games at once for the first ever time. This date to me, represents the official day Valve completely lost control of its bowels and exploded diarrhea all over itself. Steam's quality control had already gone to shit before now, but this was the avalanche point. Crucially, this batch of 100 games also contained two notable titles that should have immediately taught Valve a lesson, but didn't. Of these 100 games, one was Guise of the Wolf, a game that became notorious after its developer tried to silence criticism by having Total Biscuit's video on said game removed from YouTube. The second game was Paranautical Activity, a game that became notorious after its developer threatened to murder Valve boss Gabe Newell. Sorry about the barricade, my lord. It's at this point we should have immediately seen the problem with Valve's approval process. It was admitting games into a professional environment based on nothing more than a handful of screenshots and promises. Upon removing almost all other bars for entry, Valve almost immediately invited two reckless troublemakers into its court, and they wreaked havoc in the most public and embarrassing of ways. Unfortunately, this served as a mere hors d'oeuvre for the following years. The Steam developer meltdown became something of a running fixture as Steam Greenlight continued and Valve kept looking the other way. The most famous of these was of course Digital Homicide, and it was that particular outfit comprised of brothers James and Robert Romine that caused me to realise Steam's biggest problem. In case you don't know, Somehow. Digital Homicide were lazy asset flippers of the lowest calibre, buying character models and maps from the Unity Asset Store to create some of the worst games ever made. And yet, despite producing amateur hour shit that a child could cobble together, they were unnaturally touchy and seemed possessed of a near deluded artistic pride despite their lack of artistry. As punishment for my criticism of their horrible games, they waged a two year war on not just me, but dozens of regular 
the Steam users that culminated in them filing a lawsuit against me for $15 million and attempting to sue 100 anonymous Steam users. It was only after the second lawsuit that Valve finally took notice and terminated its association with digital homicide. But this was the point I realised the real issue with Steam. The fact of the matter is, it should never have gotten as far as two ludicrous fucking lawsuits. Digihom's behaviour up until that point had been far from professional. These are the guys who responded to criticism from anybody with insults and disregard, who gloatingly refused to fix camera issues that were legitimately making their customers sick, that filed spurious DMCA takedown strikes against critics to protect their pathetic business model, who goaded me into an audio interview that was so embarrassing for them, even Sean Spicer can listen to it and have a good old laugh. That is why one day you're gonna have enough subscribers, you're gonna make enough money on your Patreon thing, and somebody's gonna get tired of your shit and they're gonna sue you. It's, I'm not saying we are, I'm saying somebody's gonna have the money to do it, and they're gonna win. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is that what we've devolved into? Yeah, it? Exactly, you keep laughing, no, I don't because think Because we're saying some music! And I say any one of those things they did should have been considered too far for a professional. Imagine if like an artist from Media Molecule or something had done any one of the things Digital Homicide famously pulled in its short history. If they were insulting customers on social media, challenging critics to fights, threatening them with lawsuits over the phone, they'd be fired in a fucking heartbeat. But on Steam, they did business for years. And that that is the crux of Steam's real problem. Everywhere else has at least some minimal professional standards. Valve, seemingly, has none because it's focused only on one thing. Does the game work? If it's functional, it's sellable. Sometimes it doesn't even have to be that. And let's not look at the people selling them. Heaven no, even if they're fucking unhinged, volatile little monsters. This is Leto. He'll like that he just heard his own name because he's a tremendous egotist who has been thirsty for my attention, quite literally, for years. It's pathetic. Leto is the creator of this shit-looking visual novel that somehow got its way onto Steam through Greenlight. He's also pissed off at game critics because they don't cover his badly drawn incest stories. What he doesn't know is I've been gathering plenty of examples of him throwing tantrums at myself, at Total Biscuit, at Jesse Cox, just hurling abuse out there because he thinks he deserves videos and reviews and he's not getting them. Leto has attempted to harass a number of game critics and he's gotten away with it because he thought nobody noticed. Well, I did and I say this directly to Valve. Look at this man's Twitter feed. Look at this man's behavior. Look at the multiple reports of harassment and customer abuse leveled at this person and ask yourself one simple question. Is that a man you'd hire to represent Valve? Is that a man you'd be seen doing business with? If the answer is no, then I say he has no business being on Steam in the first place. He has no business doing business with your business. And that, that's just best for business. So that's the question, the knockout question that I think should act as a new litmus test for would-be Steam games. Unlike the $100 fee for submitting things to Greenlight or Steam Direct, it would actually work to stop the very worst shit from infesting Steam. Because to the deluded, to the hacks, money's no object, they don't give a shit about the money, they seem to think they're genuinely great game developers, or at least deserve hundreds of dollars selling shit because, well, they're just entitled to it, aren't they? That's how they think. This litmus test wouldn't stop everything, but it would stop the nastiest and most ugly problem the storefront has. These wingnut fucksticks who don't just make shit games, but turn out to be shit people on top of it. And I don't think that that's a, a draconian rule. Don't be a shit person. It's not that hard. Unless you're a shit person. Should Valve have continued to allow Fatfly to keep uploading copy after copy of his repeatedly unvoted shooter tactics? You'd think after the first time he called all these critics fucking queers that Valve wouldn't want him anywhere near their service, but nope, he continued for years railing against the queers and renaming his games to things like tactical anal insertion as his mind unraveled in public. Should Valve even allow the sale of games 
from companies that routinely embarrass themselves by trying to stomp down criticism on YouTube with DMCA strikes, I say no. I fucking say no. I say once you've responded in such an unprofessional manner, you lose the right to do business on a professional level. By all means, developers should have the right to debate and disagree with their critics, but when they leap to abusing YouTube's copyright system, it's high time they start accruing their own fucking strikes on Steam itself. It's about time someone faced some repercussions somewhere for repeatedly pulling that bollocks. Valve is in a unique position to install still some fucking discipline. The list of warped wannabe game developers who have stepped way beyond the lines of professionalism is shockingly long and sprawling enough to where I wouldn't be able to remember them all, though of course my brain is a highly honed database of the ones that have personally pissed me off and that I've got grudges over. But I say Valve takes a long, hard look at companies like Cobra Studio, who make games like this, then call their critics liars when they point out their games look like shit. I say Valve takes a long, hard look at companies like Stickly Games, who invented unenforceable terms of service for their terrible airport game, and even tried to circumvent YouTube's own copyright system by filing for a trademark violation over negative video coverage. I say Valve takes a long, hard look at fur fun, and how its quote-unquote developer publicly and falsely accused a respected industry composer of lying to say nothing of the further examples of cringeworthy behaviour, the inimitable, thank God. Dallas engaged in. Take a long hard look at the dozens upon dozens of shitty games that routinely empty their message boards and flag negative reviews to hide any and all criticism, while positive reviews seem dubious in origin. I say Valve looks at these companies and more and asks that question. Would we hire these people? Because right now, Val, you're doing business with all of them, and what you're saying by doing that is it's okay to have zero decorum, zero composure, zero professional respect, and zero ability to handle selling your product in a public space. You're saying this behavior is cool by you. And that's why altering the trading card system, putting $100 fees in place, all that jazz won't work. Because when you start letting anybody sell games on your service unchecked, that includes random fucking weirdos. Straight up fucking weirdos who do not have a working relationship with reality, let alone anybody else. This is why you have so many meltdowns, death threats, harassments, copyright takedowns. These individuals are unvetted and unchecked, completely unchecked to the point where literal children can upload this fucking garbage. They're children! Right now, Steam is an Applebee's that lets any random bloke walk in off the street and start making all the food, and that means a whole hell of a lot of food gets made. It also means the kitchen is full of complete fucking strangers who might have no place being allowed near the knives and hot things. They're running around Valve's kitchen, smearing shit on the walls and screaming at customers who didn't like their piss and Pringle soup, and because no standards are in place for a single iota of friggin' decorum, it continues unabashed and will do so as Steam Direct continues to let in functional games without imposing any sort of expectations upon whether the developers themselves are functional. At least that's how it's been. When I met with Valve a few months ago to discuss Steam Direct, I brought this issue up. It was the one thing I knew I had to bring up. I talked about some of these situations and how ridiculous it was that the digital homicide story had to go as far as it went before Valve finally corralled them. As someone who has been repeatedly stalked and harassed and attacked for being one of the only people to continue criticizing Greenlight, I felt uniquely prepared to argue this with Valve. And after I finally broke the neck of that disgusting lawsuit, I've committed myself to focusing on the root of the problem, the idiots and the dickheads making these shitty games. And it might be paying off. I'm yet to verify this, Valve has not confirmed it to me personally, but I hear Valve has recently committed to terminating its relationship with as many as a hundred companies for repeated abuse of their customers. And that's good if it's true, that's actually good, that's a sign that they're paying attention. This is according to a conference call an unnamed indie developer was apparently part of, with Valve warning them that dumping on customers would no longer be tolerated. Again, if true, it's a good start, but it should go further. And I know what I'm saying might sound authoritarian to some, especially on the internet where we've gotten so scared of censorship, some people get angry at me when they find out my podcasts are edited rather than uploaded as a sprawling two-hour chunk of a mess. But I don't think it's unreasonable. 
to have some terms of service detailing what is expected of a developer who wants to sell products on a professional service like Steam. Applebee's doesn't let strangers wander into the kitchen and cook because it's a fucking health hazard. And that's Applebee's. You telling me Valve can't have higher standards than a fucking Applebee's? Issue a DMCA takedown of a critical video and refuse to follow through with legal action, proving yourself a spurious abuser of the system. That's a strike. Abusing people on Twitter because your mediocre swill is being rightly ignored. It's a strike. Calling potential customers fucking queers and having public meltdowns at the slightest provocation. It's a strike. Get enough strikes. You should be told to pack it in. And that's me at my most generous. Because I've had years of dealing with this fucking scum. And I don't think I'm anywhere near unfair when I say it's about time Valve had some behavioural fucking requirements. If you want to get rid of a shit snake, you cut it off at the shithead, and there's a lot of shitheads plying their trade on Steam. Right, now let's finally talk about how pathetic it is that you need your cell phone and some what the fuck plastic crap to get mic chat working on the Switch. Oh, shut up! Shut up! You knew I'd get to it sooner. Here's a TV that looks like an apple. Of course, it's important to note that not every developer is an asshole. Uh, it's just that Steam's open door policy has invited a lot of assholes to the party. And in terms of harassment and abuse, uh, it's not one sided. Uh, sometimes the users can be harassing and abusing as well. And an issue, if we were to come up with my idea, which is to enforce some behavioural policy, uh, one issue might be uh, false flagging that, you know, misreporting people uh, because the developer isn't liked or something like that. Um, there are ways for that to go wrong, and as usual, the fix for that is something Valve doesn't like very much human oversight. They need people to look, when these developers are reported on, they need people at Valve to look at the behaviour and say, is that kosher? Do we want to do business with that person? If the answer's no, fuck off. It's actually not that hard in theory. I don't think I'm proposing anything too wacky, except for the bit where I'm expecting some human oversight. And that's, that's a problem. But, oh well. It's a good episode though, I think. Nice to be back. And uh, there are a couple of names, a couple of people featured in this video. And I'm sure they're delighted that at last they finally got a mention on the best opinion show in the industry. Because it doesn't matter if you hate me. You still thank God for me. Oh yes. You still all thank God. God for me. is wrong YouTube, it's your boy Jim Sterling with another life hack for you. Now some people think that my extended stay in the hospital led to me becoming a little bit peculiar. Don't look at me! That's bollocks, obviously. Instead, it enlightened me and allowed me to come up with a brand new life hack. They've got these things called urinals at the hospital. They're basically bottles, they look like you could keep Sunny D in them. But rather than get up and go to the toilet, you can just sort of stand up and just shovel your little lad into the top of this urinal and just piss in a bottle. And then you leave it by the sides of your bed and a nurse comes in and measures it and empties it for you. Life hack. Get yourself a gallbladder problem, go piss in a bottle, and learn a new way to urinate. Life hack! Get Surgical scars!